Okay, uh, welcome to lecture here, and we'll get started here in just a second. We're uh, going to be starting on chapter five, so we finished the last one last time, and we'll continue on. Again, these notes are up there uh, on Canvas if you need them. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so we're gonna uh, start changing gears a little bit. We've been talking about uh, bonding for a couple of chapters now. Uh, we're gonna actually start talking about uh, some other calculations, uh, grams, moles, uh, molar mass, um, empirical formulas, and those type of things here in chapter five. So we will have to pick up our calculator, I think, here. Do some of these. All right, so uh, let's get started. Maybe, let's try that again, there we go. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the atomic mass. And <clears throat> the atomic mass, just as we touched upon a little bit, um, when you look at the periodic table, that actually can be found on the periodic table. And again, it's that number that commonly people think is the mass number that we talked about way back when. So if you look at something like hydrogen, the atomic mass are those numbers that you can find basically underneath the symbols on the periodic table. And again, as we talked about, they are not the mass number, which is number of protons and neutrons, but they are the atomic mass. So they are really based on obviously how many protons, neutrons, and electrons there are in an atom. And as we talked about, obviously, um, the electron being the least massive of those three subatomic particles, while the neutron, if you remember, is the heaviest of the three, with a proton being pretty much just like an, uh, just like a neutron, just slightly lighter, but almost the same mass. And remember that a proton and neutron, again, they're both about 1,800 or so times each heavier than any electron that's flying around. So again, as we talked about when we talked about the atom, that most of the mass of the uh, atom is made up of that nucleus where we find protons and neutrons. And again, uh, the electrons have some mass, but obviously a lot less than either of those two. So clearly if we wanted to weigh something, uh, we couldn't like take, a, take an atom since it's super small, right? And just kind of pick it up and, and put it on a balance or anything like that. Um, so usually obviously in, in science when you can't really necessarily directly sort of weigh something. A lot of times what will happen is uh, they'll sort of choose a standard and they'll choose a sort of a standard to compare everybody to uh, in terms of their mass and so forth. And for atomic mass, as we will see shortly, they used an isotope of carbon as the standard. And basically they use this isotope of carbon. Um, and again, a reminder, isotopes as we talked about are the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons. Um, they use this as their sort of standard. And it was the carbon 12 isotope that they used as the standard. And the carbon 12 isotope had six protons and has six neutrons and it has a mass of exactly 12 AMU. And AMU is what is referred to as atomic mass unit. So they use this carbon-12 as a standard. It had a mass of exactly 12 AMU. And atomic mass unit is a unit that it is used, um, let's say maybe not a lot outside of maybe this chapter a little bit. We kind of use what we see on the periodic table a little bit different, but technically speaking, when you do look at that hydrogen, that is up there. That is basically in hydrogen, there's 1.008 AMU in an atom of hydrogen. So we can pull those numbers off the periodic table in what are known as AMU or atomic mass units. Um, most of the time, and especially a little bit later on in this chapter and probably every, every chapter outside of that, we really will pull that number off as, uh, as we will see later 1.008 grams per mole and sort of numerically equal to each other grams per mole and amu per atom 
Um, but that's more so how later we'll use those numbers, but you can technically kind of pull them off in those units of AMU. So one AMU has a mass equal to about one twelfth the mass of a carbon 12 isotope, and you can do some conversions um, between grams and AMU. There is a conversion. I think we'll see a little bit later as well. So basically what they did is they took all the elements that you see sort of on the periodic table, and they went, well, Hydrogen is only, you know, 8% as massive as the carbon-12 isotope. So what they basically took was, you know, 8% of 12. And that's sort of how they came up with that 1.008 number. And they did very similar type of calculations with everybody else. So again, they just sort of assigned this as a standard to compare to and did some of those calculations about, you know, this guy is only this much percentage as big, or maybe this is bigger than the carbon-12 isotope. And they use those percentages basically and the carbon-12 isotope as a standard uh, to come up with the atomic masses that we see on the periodic table. And that's what this calculation is here. So in experiments, uh, they found that, you know, hydrogen atom is about 8.4% of the size of a carbon-12. And again, if you convert 8.4% into a decimal, right? Move the decimal place two places to the left and you multiply it by the atomic mass of our standard, we get that number that we see again underneath hydrogen there on the periodic table. And similar calculations were done for other elements as we see on the periodic table. Uh, for example, you go to oxygen, you got about 16. Uh, you go to iron, you got 55, 85. And you may be asking yourself, you know, how come we're rounding like that? And typically speaking, when you do go to that periodic table and you find that number that's on the bottom, which is the atomic mass, usually we go to about, not really about, but we usually go to, I'll get rid of the about, we usually go to uh, four significant figures. So depending on the periodic table, uh, again, depending on maybe uh, when it was made, who wrote it, who made it kind of thing, um, you may see underneath the symbols a lot of numbers. You may see some numbers rounded and stuff like that. But usually it's pretty good practice to, when you pull a number off the periodic table there in terms of the atomic mass, to do some type of calculation. Uh, usually four significant figures is, is basically what you're shooting for there. Um, and then again, that's why we sort of round. So for example, on a lot of periodic tables, if you look under uh, oxygen, you'll see something like 15.999999, you know, five or something like that. So obviously a lot of times you'll have a lot of numbers there, but usually we do just round to four when we pull it off there. And also if you had to calculate something like uh, molar mass, which we'll talk about later, atomic mass, again, a lot of times four significant figures is sort of where you would do it to, but you know, not a hundred percent of the time, but that's just sort of common practice in terms of significant figures. So you may ask yourself if carbon 12 is the standard, and it has a mass of 12, you know, why when I kind of look at carbon on the periodic table, do I not see that? When I look at carbon on the periodic table, I see 12.01 listed basically. And that is because what we are actually seeing on the periodic table, even though most people call it the atomic mass, most people will call it molar mass if they're using it that way, um, what we're actually seeing is really was referred to as the average atomic mass. And the average atomic mass is basically the mass of all the naturally occurring isotopes for that particular element. So for example, for carbon, there's the carbon 12 isotope and there's also the carbon 13 isotope. And those are the naturally occurring isotopes for that particular element. So as we'll see a little bit later on, and I'll just put it here as well as maybe like a preview. There is actually a, a formula that we typically follow to calculate the atomic mass. And to calculate the atomic mass, we basically take the percentage of the first isotope, we times it by the atomic mass of the first isotope, then we add it to the percentage of the second isotope. And we times it by the atomic mass 
of the second isotope. And you basically continue that pattern. So if you have three isotopes, you take the percentage of the three is of the third isotope times by the atomic mass of the third isotope and so forth. So this is the formula that you typically can use to calculate the atomic mass of an element. So what do we mean by percentage? What we mean by percentage is because these are naturally occurring isotopes, they have what is sometimes referred to as percent abundance, relative abundance, something like that is sort of, sort of how it's uh, sort of worded. So basically, for example, say the, the carbon-12 isotope occurs 98% of the time, and the carbon-13 isotope occurs about 1% of the time. So those would be the percentages that we're talking about. Obviously, if you had a problem, you would want to make sure that the percentages added up to 100%, right? Otherwise, you'd be missing an isotope or something like that. So it should obviously add up to 100%. And again, obviously, when you do the math, you do have to convert the percentages into a decimal, right, before you do it. So again, divide by 100 or move to decimal place, whichever way that you want to do that. So I think we have an example here of sort of how we get to what we see on the periodic table. So here again, as I was mentioning, the carbon-12 isotope occurs about 98.89% of the time. The carbon-13 isotope, and remember when we have carbon-12, carbon-13. Again, a reminder that these numbers are the mass numbers, right? So these are the mass numbers. Let's get something in my way here. So I got you right. There we go. Um, there it is. Mass numbers. And again, that's the number of protons and neutrons that there are. And basically, when you have a, something like this, like I was just mentioning before, if we take this number and this number, which are the only percentage is given to us. It does add up to about 100%, so we know that we have all the naturally occurring isotopes. So for example, let's say we did this and it added up to 75%, that would mean obviously there's 25%, probably maybe have another isotope or something like that, and obviously you would have some information to figure that out in a problem. But in this case, obviously it adds up pretty much 100%, which means that we have all the naturally occurring isotopes. So what we would do is, what we were just talking about. So that's that formula I just wrote on the last slide. So this is the atomic mass. And again, this is the percentage of the first isotope, which was this 98.89% converted into a decimal. This is again, the mass of a carbon 12 isotope, which is 12 on the nose. Then we add it. And that's just the part that always messes people up. People always want to multiply these guys together, but you're actually just going to add. And then this is the percentage of the second isotope in this case, which was our 1.11%, again, converted into a decimal, times the mass of that carbon-13 isotope, which is this number here. And if we do all that, that is how we get to our 12.01 that we see on the periodic table. So remember that what we are actually seeing on that periodic table in terms of atomic mass is really the average atomic mass of all the naturally occurring isotopes. And again, for the most part, people leave the average part off of the name there. They just call it the atomic mass. Uh, but that technically is what it is. Also important to remember that technically speaking, if you could reach down and sort of grab some different carbon atoms, if you will, you probably would never well, you would never find one that really has a mass of 12.01. You would either find one that's like a carbon-12 isotope, which would have the mass of 12, or you would find one that's a carbon-13 isotope that has a mass of 13.00335 AMU. Um, again, these are just average values that we sort of use for the atomic mass. Any questions on that? And we'll see this calculation a little bit later on in this chapter as well, I think. So atoms obviously have very tiny masses. Um, so again, um, this is sort of the relationship between an AMU and a gram. And as you can see, one AMU is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. That is a super small number. Um, and again, that's why sometimes we will use AMU instead of uh, sort of just grams, because grams would be a super small number. But numerically speaking, as we'll talk about a little later on as well, numerically speaking, 
the AMU and grams per mole, which is commonly what we use, actually end up being the same number. So um, not to get confused with the idea of just using grams versus grams per mole, which becomes the same number. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that. So here's just some kind of conversions that you could do using really the atomic mass as a conversion factor. So when we go to the periodic table, like we talked about, we can find 12.01 underneath carbon. And really you can use that as a conversion factor. You can say there's 12.01 AMU and an atom of carbon, R and an atom of carbon on top, there's 12.01 AMU. So atomic mass, later molar mass, which is sort of the same numbers, uh, we usually will use them as a conversion factor. And that's what we do here. Remember that it's been a little bit since we've done some calculations, but we do want to kind of set it up dimensional analysis way so that we can see the units canceling. So again, we can see that the atoms cancel, leaves us with AMU, which gives us 5176 AMU. Same thing with aluminum. If we go to aluminum, there's 26.98 as its atomic mass. Again, that means there's 26.98 AMU in an atom. R in an atom, there's 26.98 AMU. So again, you can get pretty much two conversion factors uh, from that. And here again, the atoms will cancel. That's going to leave us with AMU. Again, mathematically, what we're doing is taking 75 times 2698 and dividing it by one in this case. So, you know, how do we sort of figure out, uh, you know, the sort of these atomic masses? Maybe how do we figure out the masses of these different isotopes? And one common way that we do that is we use a process known as mass spec. And mass spec basically will figure out the abundances and the masses of isotopes uh, put in through a mass spectrometer. And basically, we'll see a picture of it in a second, but basically atoms and molecules are sort of ionized. Then they sort of get sent down this tube. Um, and as they're moving down this tube, they're broken up into basically fragments and really separate it out by sort of size and mass. And as they go through, they go through a magnetic field. Remember, a magnetic field, electrical field, right, has an effect on sort of charged particles and able to make it go one way or the other, sort of bend towards a certain charge, positive or negative, or bend towards the North Pole or the South Pole like a magnet, and it's able to basically bend around. And this is a, a common sort of mass spec sort of graph that comes out. And as you can see, what ends up coming out is you get these peaks. And these peaks occur at sort of different masses. So it's able to separate out these isotopes into different masses. And you could also, as we see here, this is what we're talking about when we talk about, for example, carbon 12 is 98% abundant. This is what we're talking about, percent abundance. So you could kind of go over and go, okay, this guy is about there. This guy is about there in terms of the percentage, give or take with a little bit of rounding, you know, it's about 100% of it. One's just above 75, maybe one's just above 25. So not perfect, but in that ballpark, you could figure out the relative abundance of each of those or percentage of each of those. And again, this is really where we get those values to put into that a formula that we just saw that atomic mass equals the percentage times the AMU of the isotope plus the percentage times the AMU of the second isotope. And again, that's sort of where we're able to get all of these values sort of from is by using an experiment such as this. And this is what it sort of looks like, the actual setup. You have your sample that comes in here. It gets heated up and basically, uh, ionizes it into sort of particles. Again, it goes through an electrical field They're going to separate out those guys, right, by sort of charges. Also gets bent around a magnet, also gonna kind of separate them out. And as you can see at the end, it hits the detector at different locations. Location. And again, that when you look at the sort of graph that comes out, one side of the graph is more the heavier particles, the lighter particles are able to kind of go there. 
again, the lighter particles are going to be able to be bent a lot more, right? Because they're lighter. So they're going to be able to be bent and go further away as opposed to the more heavier guys. They can't be bent as much as they go through that magnet. And obviously they're going to hit a little further to the right there on sort of the graph, if you will, uh, when you see it. So that's sort of the setup of a mass spec. And that brings us to sort of a problem. So why don't you take a couple minutes here and calculate the atomic mass of copper in AMU based on the information that is here. So take a couple minutes and see what you come up with. Okay, uh, so let's take a look and see how we're doing. So again, here we do have a couple different isotopes of uh, copper. 
and we have uh, copper 63 and we have copper 65. And in this case, uh, we see that copper 63 has a percentage of 69.17% with a mass of 62.9396 AMU. We also have uh, copper 65, which they don't give us the percentage, but they do give us the mass of 64.9278 AMU. So the first thing that we could kind of probably safely assume is because they didn't mention that there's any other isotopes involved, we would assume that these guys are the two main isotopes here for carbon, or carbon for copper, which means that when we add up those percentages, they should add up to 100%. So we can find this sort of missing percentage by taking 100% minus the 69.17, which was our other guy. And that would tell us that probably pretty safely, 30.83 would be the percentage of our other isotope there. Again, assuming that these two make up pretty much 100% of everything. So in this case, they didn't necessarily give you both percentages, but again, uh, if you know you have 100% of everything in terms of how many isotopes there are, you could kind of use that 100 to figure out the missing percentage. So now that we have the percentages of each isotope and the uh, atomic mass of each isotope, we're good to go into our formula. So we could do the atomic mass. Again, we're gonna take our first isotope we do need to convert it into a decimal. So you could either take the 69.17 divided by 100, or you could just move the decimal point, which is basically gonna do the same thing for you. We're gonna times it by 62.9396 AMU. Again, we're going to add it to our next isotope. Again, converting this guy into a, a decimal as well. So divide it by 100 or move the decimal and write the right number. And if we do all that good stuff there, 0. 0.6917 times 62.9396 plus 0. 0.3083 times 64.9278 going to give us 63.55 as the atomic mass for carbon. I, I always want to say carbon on that one. I don't know why. For copper. And again, if you go to the periodic table and actually look up copper instead of carbon, uh, you will see, again, it is 63.55 there on the periodic table. So obviously, other than calling it the wrong element, I suppose we did all right. Any questions on that calculation, atomic mass? So, you know, uh, like I said, probably in most cases, in most calculations, as we go through this chapter here and other chapters, you're probably not going to pull off the information from the periodic table in AMU. Uh, we will use different units, which we're going to talk about now, pretty much uh, grams per mole. But more importantly, this is you do need to know, obviously, how to calculate the atomic mass using the percentages of the isotopes the relative abundance, again, they're sometimes referred to, and the atomic mass of each one. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, so then let us get into really, probably more how we'll use some of these numbers that we've been talking about, especially from the periodic table. And it really does uh, revolve around the idea of moles. So when we talk about moles uh, in chemistry, not the furry guy, but the, uh, it is moles, and that is the abbreviation for moles. They did need to abbreviate some way, so they dropped the, L, uh, the E off of the end of it. So one important thing about that abbreviation that people very often will screw up on, I guess is the way to say that, is uh, very often in calculations when people see MOL, their mind automatically goes to molecules. So they think molecules when they see that, 
but again, it is moles. And again, that is abbreviation and used a lot to abbreviate moles. So just keep that in mind. Um, so in life, right, we have a lot of names that represent a certain amount of something. Um, so for example, as you can see on the screen, if we have a dozen eggs, we know that when somebody says I got a dozen eggs or I'm in trouble and I bought you a dozen roses, right? Or something like that. That means you came up with 12, right? Is what that means. If you have a pair of shoes, that means two, right? If you got a pair of something, hey, if you're old enough and you remember these called, give you pencils and grosses, which I think is uh, 144 a gross of pencils or something like that. But when we talk about sort of chemistry and the, the word mole, it actually does represent something. And it represents that number on the bottom there. In most cases, we do round that. That one mole of anything will equal 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And that number is Avogadro's number. Uh, and again, that's usually how it gets rounded right about there, 6.022 times 10 to the 23. Now, what also confuses people when they use Avogadro's number is um, the units associated with it. It could be uh, particles, could be atoms as the units, it could be uh, molecules as the units, could be pizzas in case you're hungry, could be shoes in case you need shoes. So the unit part of Avogadro's number can change sort of depending on the situation and sort of what you're applying Avogadro's number to. Um, again, if you're dealing with a molecule, you would use molecules. If you're using, dealing with just an atom, you would use atoms. Those two are obviously in chemistry, probably the most often units that you'll use with Avogadro's number, either atoms or molecules there. So one mole of anything will basically equal 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And really we could use this as a conversion factor. You could say that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms, for example, and a mole of something. Or again, you could use it in the opposite way, put the mole on top and a 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms on the bottom. So again, we could use this as a conversion factor. And really this is our conversion factor to go from moles to atoms or molecules and vice versa to go from atoms or molecules to moles. So the other thing that people sometimes do uh, a little crazily with this number is they go, well, I learned this number. I probably should use it in every single calculation I ever do um, because why else would I learn the number? So you don't want to use Avogadro's number in every calculation. Um, I've seen it where people use it at the beginning of the calculation. They multiply by it. And then sometimes later on in the calculation, they at least divide by it so they get rid of it. So it actually comes out okay. But you should only use Avogadro's number if the problem gives you a number that is in atoms, molecules, particles, something like that, or you're asked to solve for something that's in atoms, molecules, or particles. Again, if you're not given any of those units, you really shouldn't be using Avogadro's number. Um, but it's really, again, those are the keywords to know, oh, I probably should use sort of Avogadro's number here. So that brings us to another important sort of relationship that we could get and that is what is known as the molar mass. And the molar mass can also be found on the periodic table. And as we were just talking about atomic mass, which is that number that's on the bottom, this is also where we get our molar mass from. It's the same number. So how you usually will basically pull the information off the periodic table is, for example, for hydrogen, you would say there is 1.008 grams of hydrogen in every mole of hydrogen, or the molar mass of hydrogen is 1.008 grams per mole. And you may say, wait, isn't that AAMU? And you would be right. Numerically speaking, 
the atomic mass in AMU per atom is the same as grams per mole. So they actually do come out the exact same when you do the conversion. So again, if you have something from the periodic table that's an AMU per atom, technically, it's the same as grams per mole. So most of the time, that is the units you're going to use when you pull it off the periodic table. And you could kind of tie everything together that we just talked about. So basically in one mole, of hydrogen, there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen, which would be Avogadro's number. And as we see up here in one mole of hydrogen, there's 1.008 grams. And you can do that for any element you like. In one mole of carbon, there would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon and in one mole of carbon from the periodic table there would be 12.01 grams right? so you could get all this information from the periodic table and the molar mass is essentially a conversion factor to go from grams to moles and moles to grams and So grams to moles, or moles to grams, we use the molar mass, which again is units of grams per mole. And you can write really conversion factors for them. So for example, if you took our hydrogen, you could say there's 1.008 grams per mole, or you could flip it around and go, there is one mole is, one point zero zero eight grams for hydrogen you could do that for anybody as well again a carbon you could say there's twelve point oh one grams per mole carbon or in a mole of carbon there's twelve point oh one grams so really atomic uh, molar mass and Avogadro's numbers they're really just conversion factors to allow us to go through sort of different units. And uh, we go through different units by using these conversion factors and dimensional analysis to do it. Now, you don't only have to, you can't only apply uh, molar mass necessarily to just atoms by themselves. You could also do it to sort of molecules as well. So for example, if we had hydrogen, uh, hydrogen, water, if we had water, basically to get the molar mass of water, we would just add up all the parts from the periodic table. So that's gonna be two times 1.008 grams per mole for the hydrogen, plus 16 grams per mole for our oxygen that is there. And when you add that together for water, you get 18.02 grams per mole as the molar mass which also means you could use it as a conversion factor. You could say 18.02 grams per mole of water. And again, if you needed it the other way, you could put the moles of water on top and it would be 18.02 grams of water. Now, we could also relate Avogadro's number to something like water. In one mole of water, there would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And now water is not just an atom by itself. It's a molecule. So the units here of Avogadro's number would become molecules. And again, you could use that as a conversion factor. You could say the 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules over a mole of water or vice versa, you could flip it on top. The mole of water is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. So again, the most of the time we will use these things really as sort of conversion factors. And when we go to the periodic table, that number underneath that we've been talking about as the atomic mass is also the molar mass, which again is how many grams there are per one mole. And that's important when you do the molar mass, the units of molar mass are grams per mole. And it's always one mole on the bottom. 
So sometimes people, when they calculate the molar mass of something, not so much right now, but later on when we talk about sort of uh, equations and stuff like that, uh, for example, in an equation, there might be a two in front of it. When they go to calculate the molar mass, they always want to uh, double it and stuff like that. So whenever you're asked to calculate the molar mass or whenever you need to calculate the molar mass of something, you should strictly just take the formula, whether that formula is in an equation and there's a coefficient in front of it or anything like that, but you simply just take the formula, add up all the parts, and that is how many grams there would be, again, in one mole. Any questions on that there? What we see on the screen is a mole of, uh, of each of these sort of substances. And if we did look at these substances, it's a little hard to sort of tell here, but if we took a mole sample of everything, it may not appear to be the same amount. And the reason it would not be perhaps the same amount, if you will, or appear to be the same amount is because if I take a mole of sulfur, for example, sulfur has, if you look on the periodic table, it says 3207 underneath sulfur, which means if I took one mole of sulfur, that represents 32.07 grams. And that would be very different than if I took one mole of carbon, a mole of carbon is only 12 grams, right? So if you looked at sort of a mole of everything, it may not look like the same amount. And that's because a mole of everything, mole of different elements represents a different amount in terms of grams. Again, as a per, uh, opposed to something like magnesium, a mole of magnesium is 24.31 grams, while a, uh, a mole of bromine is about 79 grams. So even though they're all technically one mole quantities, they may appear to be different amounts. And again, that's because a mole of one element represents a certain amount of grams, and that is different than a mole of another element. Any questions on that there? All right, so these are just some of the conversions, and you probably won't be doing too many conversions between grams and AMU, but just to illustrate here, one gram is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms, uh, 23 AMU, or one AMU is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24. This relationship here, and you can kind of see it here, that's our Avogadro's number. And that is why numerically speaking, the uh, atomic mass in AMU per atom is the same as grams per mole. And that's because atom, right? You would have to use Avogadro's number. And here, Avogadro's number would be used as well. And it all cancels out basically and becomes the same number. So this sort of relationship here is why these numbers are numerically going to be the same. So this is a little schematic as we sort of talked about our conversion factor really to go from grams to moles or moles to grams. Again, is the molar mass from the periodic table. And that is a conversion you do a lot, obviously in chemistry, you probably did it last time as well in the previous class, but that is definitely a conversion that you do a lot. And then obviously if you need to get anywhere going from atoms or molecules or end up in atoms or molecules, that is when we should use Avogadro's number. All right, so you got this one here. We want to calculate the number of grams of iron and 15.7 moles of iron. And just in case you don't have a periodic table, Iron's molar mass is 55.85 grams per mole. All right, so see what you come up with and take a minute or so.
Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so the first thing you want to kind of determine is, should I use Avogadro's number or not? So here we want to calculate number of grams and 15.7 moles. So we have no mention of atoms, no mention of molecules. So I do not need um, Avogadro's number. I do need obviously the molar mass as that's our conversion factor to do that. I'm gonna start with the 15.7 moles of iron. Again, when you pull that number off the periodic table, you can use it as a conversion factor as 55, 85 grams per mole. Our moles is 55, 85 grams. So again, when we do set it up, we do wanna set it up as sort of dimensional analysis, which means we wanna see the units canceling. So the moles are on top, so opposites cancel which means we do need to use it in this fashion. So we need our 55, 85 grams per mole. Again, the moles will cancel. Gonna leave us with grams and about 877, it looks like, of iron. Any question on that calculation there? In terms of uh, sig figs, if you're curious on that, uh, basically the molar mass is sort of considered a conversion factor, so you don't worry about it. So the original number we started with was 15.7, which has three significant figures, and we would probably round it there to 877, which is three significant figures. As on my calculator, I had 876.845, so we round it up, obviously, to 877. Any questions on that particular one there? So why don't you try this one? This is lithium, 6.941, I think, for the periodic table. <clears throat> so again, from the periodic table, lithium, 6.941 grams per mole. So take a minute or so here and see what you come up with. Okay, so uh, here, uh, same idea. Uh, we're looking for moles uh, and we're starting with grams. Again, no mention of atoms, no mention of molecules. So don't need Avogadro's number. Again, we wanna use our molar mass as our conversion factor. So here we're gonna start with the 77.8 grams of lithium. Here grams are on the top. So we actually wanna use this in the reverse fashion and put our grams on the bottom so that they cancel, which is essentially dividing by it. Again, the grams cancel each other out. And what we're left with is eleven point two moles of lithium in this particular case. Again, uh, same deal, uh, three significant figures on that first number. And uh, we end up with 11.2, which is three significant figures on our answer. Any questions on that particular one? Okay. Let's see here. So why don't you try this one here? Uh, how many atoms are there in 0.551 grams of potassium? Again, if you don't have your periodic table, potassium is uh, 
3910 on the periodic table. All right, see what you come up with. Okay, so uh, let's take a look here. So when we look at this, uh, we're looking for how many atoms. So again, that's a keyword that we do need to, in this case, use Avogadro's number, which remember there's uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms in a mole. But so obviously before we can use that as a conversion factor, we do need to get it into moles, which it is not. So we do need to first go from grams to moles and then we could go from moles to atoms. And again, the molar mass here is gonna be our first part of the conversion. So we would take 0 0.551 grams of potassium. Using the molar mass from the periodic table, grams on top, so we want it on the bottom so they cancel. That's gonna give us 3910 grams per mole of potassium. Now, you don't necessarily have to get a number at this point. Uh, you could continue on with the calculation, but if you did get a number at this point, you would have some number like 0 0.014092, and I'm just going to take it to a few digits there uh, so I don't lose anything with rounding. At this point, we're in moles, which now will allow us to use Avogadro's number, so we could take our number here. and moles are on top. So we want Avogadro's number that are to be on the top and a mole to be on the bottom so that they cancel. Remember, you wanna make sure you use your exponent button here. So we're gonna times it by 6.022 to 23, and that will get us something like 8.49 times 10 to the 21 atoms of potassium. Any question on that calculation? As I mentioned uh, just a second ago, um, you don't necessarily have to get that middle answer. You could obviously do all these calculations sort of back to back and just kind of keep lining them up, uh, which is perfectly fine. A reminder that as we talked about when we did conversions and those type of things, if you do end up getting a number kind of like what I did there, you may want to take it to a good number of digits. So again, you don't lose anything in terms of the rounding aspect of it. Um, personally, I, what I did is I just continued on with my calculator that had the entire number still there and just continued to finish. Any questions on that particular one there? Okay. 
So let's see here. Let's get those for a second. Let's talk about let's talk about this one here, and so uh, how it's a little bit different, and just kind of go through it here together. Let us talk about if we wanted to figure out how many atoms there are of hydrogen in this particular compound here, which is C three H eight O. Now, in this particular case, we're not interested ultimately in the entire thing. We're interested in just the hydrogen part of it. Now, we're interested in atoms of it, which tells us for sure we do need to use Avogadro's number. So we are going to need to use our 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. Also tells us that we do need to get the moles of this. So that's probably a good place to start. Now. Remember, to get the moles, we need the molar mass. So we do need to go to the periodic table and we do need to calculate the molar mass of this guy. So the molar mass from the periodic table, we have three carbons, each at 12.01 grams per mole from the periodic table, plus eight hydrogens, both, all eight, 1.008 grams per mole from the periodic table, plus one oxygen, which is 16, grams per mole from the periodic table. So if we add all that together, three times 12.01 plus eight times 1.008 plus a 16, gets us something like 60.09 grams per mole, which would be the molar mass of our compound here, our molecule here. Any questions on that? So the first thing we want to do is really take 72.5 grams of the entire thing. We're going to use the molar mass of the entire thing. So we want the grams on the bottom so they cancel. And if we do that, 72.5 divided by that gives us something like one point yeah, we'll call it 1.21 moles of C3H8O. So we've got it into moles, but we do have a little problem here. We got it into moles of the entire thing. And in the problem here, we're not interested in everybody there. We're really just interested in the atoms part. So we actually need a way to go from the entire thing to just, you know, the one thing that we're interested in. And the way that you could do that is you could actually use the formula to do that for you. Because when we look at the formula, these little numbers on the bottom, subscripts, and obviously a one for if nothing is written there those actually represent the moles of each of those elements. So we could actually use the formula as a conversion factor. We could say that in one mole of the entire thing, there is three moles of carbon. And again, the three comes from the little subscript that is there. We could also say in one mole of the entire thing, there is eight moles of hydrogen. Again, the number there. And we could also see that in one mole of the entire thing, there is one mole of oxygen. Again, no number written means one. So each of these are equalities, which means for each of these that I wrote there, you really can have two conversion factors. So for example, for the carbon, you could say one mole of C3H8 O over three moles of carbon, or you could say in three moles of carbon, there is one mole of C3H8O. So you can kind of use it as a conversion factor. In this case, we're interested in hydrogen. So we're going to use this relationship that we got from the actual formula to allow us to go from moles of the entire thing 
to moles of just the hydrogen part. Any questions on that part of it? This is also why it's important to get our grams that we started with into moles so that everything cancels out, right? So that's why we had to first do this step here to get us into moles because all these relationships are really a mole to mole relationship. So we need to make sure everybody's in the right units and they cancel. So that would be our next step. We would take our 1.21 moles of the entire thing. We would use our relationship from the formula that says in one mole of the entire thing, there is eight moles of hydrogen. And this is gonna now allow us to go again from the whole thing to just the hydrogen part. And if I do that times it by eight, 9.65 moles of hydrogen at this point. And now we're closer to where we want to end up with, we're now at moles of hydrogen, but we want atoms. So the last thing that we need to do is use the Avogadro's number to get us to atoms. So the last step here would be in a mole of hydrogen, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of hydrogen, which is Avogadro's number. Moles are gonna cancel just like they did here. And if we do that, I'm gonna actually go up with it, I think. So we go with that with the answer above, 6.022 exponent button 23 gives us 5.81 times 10 to the 24 atoms of hydrogen in this case. Again, that's where that came from. Any questions on that calculation? So a lot going on in this calculation, but sort of highlights all the stuff that we've been talking about. Again, molar mass, if you have something that's not just one thing by itself, but like a molecule or something like that, again, you just add up all the parts. If for some reason you're interested in not the entire thing, but just one of the elements involved in a formula, you could actually use the formula and the subscripts as the mole to mole relationship. And then obviously use Avogadro's number. Any questions on any of those steps where anything came from? Okay, so let's see. Here you go, you got a couple of things here. Let's, why don't you try these? How many moles are there in 23.2 grams of ethanol? And how many molecules? I'll give you some numbers in case you don't have a periodic table. Hydrogen, 1.008 grams per mole. Carbon, 12.01 grams per mole. And oxygen, 16 grams per mole. All right, so take a couple of minutes there and see what you come up with.
Okay, uh, so let's take a look here. So they're kind of related, both parts of the problem. So really what we want to find is uh, two things. We want to find the moles, and we also want uh, to find the molecules. So obviously to find the moles, and we're starting with grams, we do need the molar mass, so we just want to add up the parts here. So the molar mass here is going to be two times our 12.01 grams per mole plus our six times 1.008 grams per mole for our hydrogen and 16 grams per mole there for our oxygen. And that's going to give us 4607 grams per mole. Okay, I'll try that again. 4607, that sounds right. Uh, grams per mole. Again, all this comes from the periodic table. We're just adding up all the parts. And again, we're going to use this really as a conversion factor. So we could start with our 23.2 grams of our ethanol. We're going to use our molar mass as our conversion factor. So grams are going to go on the bottom. Again, the grams will cancel out here. And the answer to the first part there will be, we got there, 0. 0.504 grams as our answer for the first part of the question. Any questions on the first part there? Now, since they sort of separated it and we want now molecules, again, the keyword there is molecules. So that's going to activate our Avogadro's number here, which again, in this case, would be molecules per mole. Molecules because here we're dealing with a molecule and not just like iron by itself or an atom. So we actually could just continue on at this point with that number. That is, uh, I'm sorry, that should be moles. My bad on the units there. That should be moles, obviously, which would be good over here. There we go. So that definitely should be moles. And we're going to use Avogadro's number here. Again, we want the moles to cancel now that we've got the right units there. 6.022 times 10 to 23. Again, these are now going to become molecules because we're dealing with a molecule. Moles will cancel. We're going to multiply and make sure again that we use our exponent button, 6.022 exponent button, 23 gives us 3.03 .03 times 10 to the 23 molecules of our C2H6O in this case. Any questions on any of those there? Yeah. Okay, one last one here. Let's try that. We want to know the mass in grams of one molecule of caffeine. So I'll give you some of the numbers there, same as we had on the previous one. 1201 for carbon, hydrogen, 1.008 grams per mole, nitrogen, 1401 grams per mole, and oxygen. 16 grams per mole. Again, all that comes from the periodic table in case you ever need to find it yourself. Um, and again, we're looking here for the mass of one, the mass in grams of one molecule of caffeine. So see what you come up with. We'll talk about it.
Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So in this case, we're starting with uh, one molecule of C8H10M4O2. And obviously, molecules means Avogadro's number probably involved. So we do need to use Avogadro's number here, which would be molecules per mole. And that will allow us to convert it into moles. So we could do our first little step there. Again, molecules are going to be on the bottom in this case so that they cancel. Moles of our caffeine. I'm just going to write caffeine at this point. <laughs> and the molecules will cancel at that point. And we would take 1 divided by 6.022 to 23. Again, at this point, you don't necessarily need to get a number. But just in case you did, you have some number like this, I think. And at this point, we're in moles of our caffeine. Two, as I run out of the screen, sorry about that. Ten, I think. All right. So we're in moles, and now we really do want to get to grams. So we do need the molar mass to do that. So we need to add up all the parts from the periodic table. So that's going to be eight times 12.01 grams per mole for our carbon, 10 times 1.008 grams per mole for our hydrogen, plus four times 14.01 grams per mole for our nitrogen, plus two times 16 grams per mole for our oxygen. That is a lot of numbers. But I think when you're all done with all those numbers, 194.2 grams per mole looks like the right number that you end up with. So continuing on with our calculation, now that we have the conversion factor that we need, we're going to take our 1.661 times 10 to minus 24 moles of our caffeine. We're going to now multiply by the molar mass. So the grams are going to go on top. The moles will cancel. And we will end up with 3.225. Times 10 to the minus 22 grams of caffeine here. Or, well. So, one individual molecule of caffeine has a mass of 3.225 times 10 to the minus 22 grams. Very small number, which is what we would expect from one individual molecule. Any questions on any of those steps? I did four significant figures because we had one, which is kind of like an exact number. Because uh, that's kind of what the uh, molar mass is for. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay. We will wrap it up here for lecture today. We will come lab in about you know, 9.50, 9.45, and we'll do experiment seven. So make sure you put here if you haven't done so already. And I'll see everybody in about 20, 25 minutes.